Hey there, and welcome back to XCOM. My name is Pete, and today we complete episode 40 of our XCOM Enemy Within Iron Man Impossible walkthrough. In the last episode, we completed an Exalt Covert Data Recovery mission and saw the first glimpse of Assault Luisa Santoso in action, who definitely impressed with six kills in her very first mission. We also discovered psionic abilities within our heavy Kim Lupai, and depending on what our next mission is going to be, we might see those in action today. We will very likely see more of Luisa regardless of mission type, as she should be close to her next promotion, and of course we want to level her up quickly. The soldier we're focusing on to start today's episode, however, is heavy Shoji Zhang, who we will now also test for psionic abilities. It was revealed in the last episode that we have another guaranteed psionic soldier waiting in a net, so we will postpone her testing for a while and instead see if Shoji harbors any hidden powers. Shoji is the sole candidate because of his high will score, which makes him the most likely to come back with a positive test. Since we have made it into a new month, we should also search for exalt cells one more time, as the scan is once again cheap and we are close to finding their base. Positive identification confirmed. Exalt cell location verified. And there we go, we do in fact have another cell in Egypt, so let's get to work. Our covert operative for this mission will once again be Annette. She did a fine job last time, and for the moment we don't really have a lot of uses for her in other missions, so this is a good way for her to collect some experience points. Covert operative deployed to disrupt Exalt cell in Egypt. And that's all we have to take care of before we fire up the scanners for the first time, so let's do that now and see if we detect any alien activity. Satellite coverage now available over Egypt. No aliens, but we have completed another very important research project in Titan Armor. This is the armor with the highest health bonus in the entire game. It doesn't really have any other major features like a grappling hook or a defense bonus, but for frontline fighters it is one of the best options available. Now the research project also unlocks the third and final tier of mech armor, the paladin, which comes with two more interesting abilities. However, we will probably not see it built today, as it is quite expensive and I'm not entirely sure whether or not our mech trooper Nicholas is worth this investment. For our next research project, we are now going to look into the Heavy Plasma, which will unlock plasma weapons for our heavies, and we have quite a few of those, as well as the best mech trooper weapon in the game. I appreciate your efforts to support the research team, Commander. I've already put the new recruits to work in the lab. And up next, we'll stop by in engineering. The new engineers arrived this morning, Commander. We're always glad to have more help down here. Here we want to purchase three suits of the brand new Titan armor, which costs us over 300 credits, but it will help tremendously and also unlocks another achievement. Mark it in the history books. This is the end of an era for mankind. Even after we've defeated the remaining aliens, what then? Have we sacrificed our own humanity for a taste of their technology? And if we manage to exploit this power further, do we risk being consumed by it, presumably just as they were? Now at this point we can also take a quick look at the potential upgrade for our mech trooper Nicholas, and we can see here on the left that upgrading his mech armor to tier 3 comes with a 100 credit price tag, but also demands an investment of 100 units of meld. However, we are going to have other mechs in this playthrough, and those might even play a more important role in our long-term strategy than Nicholas, so let's not invest too much at this point, especially since Meld is hard to come by. Instead, let us simply continue scanning. We've got a large contact and it's coming in fast. We're going to have a difficult time keeping up with this one. Alright, looks like we got really lucky here. In the bottom left you can see that we just transferred our new Firestorm jets and we were right on time. We have a new, even larger enemy ship in Europe and for this one we will need the new and improved firepower. Engaging bogey. Nearing strike range. Engaging 
Alright, UFO down, our firestorm took a few hits, but nothing that will keep it out of action for long. With a regular interceptor, however, things would likely have turned out a lot differently. Let us now assemble our squad to investigate the crash site, and considering the size of the UFO, we need to be prepared. Still, we won't change much compared to our last mission. Like I promised, Luisa will be part of this one as well, but her, Andrea and our other assault, Adam, will all equip the new Titan armor. This will drastically improve the amount of hit points they have, although at the cost of removing the grappling hook and slightly reducing their movement range. Luisa and Andrea now enter combat with 16 hit points, Adam meanwhile gets up to 20 because of his extra conditioning ability, and with that he now has one hit point more than our mech trooper Nicholas. Since we're fighting aliens again, we will also equip the arc thrower with Adam, perhaps we can capture a new species or collect a valuable weapon from one we already know. Loud and clear, Big Sky. We'll monitor those readings from here. Strike One is authorized to assault the alien craft. Okay, and that alien craft is officially called a Supply Barge, a fairly large UFO that is mostly used for, as the name implies, supplies and equipment drops. Simply because of its size, we should expect some resistance. I think four to five groups of aliens are present on a crashed Supply Barge. One thing we need to keep in mind with this type of UFO is that large parts of the ship's roof are actually accessible, and not only with grappling hooks, so we might be able to use that to our advantage, but we should also keep an eye out for aliens above us from time to time. For the moment though, we have to get inside first, and who better to scout ahead than Adam. Alright, and he immediately finds some hostiles. It looks like we have a mechtoid accompanied by two sectoids in this first area of the ship's interior. And let's not disturb them too early, they're still quite far away, so we can safely put everyone behind cover and then activate a round of overwatches, including a pistol overwatch for Resilius, so that we can perhaps surprise our enemies, who should be moving around as that is what mechtoids usually do. And indeed, we have a line of sight here with Mr. Wargal, and he connects for a critical hit with his plasma pistol, taking the first sectoid out of the fight already. The other two enemies disappear into the shadows, the mechtoid has gone on overwatch itself, and we're also informed that the first of two melt canisters is somewhere roughly ahead of us. Now, our first task here is to locate our opponents, and once again, we can use Adam for the job. And that was easy, both enemies are standing there, literally with their backs against the wall, and right behind them we can also see them melt. Since the mechtoid is still on overwatch, let's get rid of that first before we make any other moves, and with a run and gun from Adam here we can also take two quick shots afterwards. A 75% chance to hit is nothing crazy, but with two attempts we should be able to do some damage. The first shot connects, the second one misses and we still have 18 hit points left to remove, and then of course there's still the sectoid, but let's not worry too much about it at this point. Our next attempt at the mechtoid will now be with Emilia, who is a little more accurate than Adam. Her laser rifle does 5 points of damage and perhaps we can follow that up with a blast from Nicholas's railgun. Lovely, that brings the mechtoid down to only 4 hit points and I would say let's try to continue Luisa's killing spree and move her in with a run and gun next. Very nice, another kill from Miss Santoso, and the sectoid is now an easy target for Resilius. And there we are, the first group of hostiles is defeated, all we can do now is move up with Andrea, put her on overwatch and end the turn. Ah, 
No new aliens appear for now, so the melt becomes our number one priority. Let's once again scout ahead with Adam to see if the path is clear. And that does indeed seem to be the case. After moving to higher ground, Adam does not spot any hostiles, so let's bring everyone else up as well. Apart from Mac Trooper Mahoney, everyone will move up to the high ground, if you want to call it that, while Nicholas will stay on the ground. We used a few dashes on this turn, so not everyone can go on Overwatch, but three soldiers keeping their eyes peeled should hopefully keep us safe. Once again, no aliens in sight, so let's keep moving towards the meld with a full dash from Amelia. She will then be able to grab it just in time on the next turn, and since the meld container is so conveniently placed right next to the big energy field leading into the UFO's next area, we will move everyone else towards that position as well. We are making sure to have a few soldiers on Overwatch again, but at this point it seems like whatever aliens we have in front of us are patiently waiting behind the energy field. And indeed, another turn passes by without any hostile sightings. We do, however, receive a rough location of the second melt container. But let's grab this one first before we worry about the other. In hand, Commander. Now, the melt trail was pointing slightly over to the left, but I don't think it's necessary to change our approach just because of that. Entering the next area right through the middle appears to be a good strategy, especially considering how that energy field is placed a little further in the back compared to the two smaller ones on the left and right. With our breaching squad in place, we can then activate another round of overwatches and wait out the alien's turn. This time we hear movement on the other side, so let's deactivate the barrier and see what we're dealing with. Alright, we have a new type of enemy here, the Heavy Floater. It is fairly similar to the regular floater, only that it has almost three times the hit points, a slightly better aim and a powerful weapon, as well as the ability to use grenades. Combine that with its unpredictable maneuverability and you have a potent and dangerous enemy, one that we should therefore take out quickly. Now, luckily for us, one of the floaters has temporarily moved out of sight, so to attack us it will have to move again, which could allow us to take it out first with a few carefully placed overwatches. Still, its two companions are right in front of us, so let's do something about that, starting with a grenade from Andrea. Despite their heavy armor, the floaters are not considered robotic enemies, so she only does the usual 6 points of damage, but that's enough to follow things up with Resilius. A critical hit off the headshot gets us the first kill, and we can now shoot again thanks to Double Tap. Alright, another critical, this time just one point shy of the kill. Looks like we can get Louisa another easy one here. Her chance to hit the flying enemy is pretty low though, so let's increase the odds by firing twice. We only need to hit once with the pistol. And the first shot is enough to get her the kill. Now we only have the third currently hidden floater left, so let's set up a few overwatches and see what it does. And there it is, zooming around the corner right into reaction fire from Adam, Emilia and Nicholas. And since all three of them land their shots, the floater evaporates before it can fire, and we are once again reminded of the melt location and can now continue exploring the ship, as always with a cloaked Adam work. Already there. And we're not getting any rest here, just a few meters up ahead he spots two sectoid commanders. 
Their psionic abilities could lead to several of our soldiers being mind control, which is of course not ideal, but not ideal that also describes their position very nicely, because they are sitting on the ground while we can actually climb on top of the roof overlooking the walkway in the middle. Once we reveal our troops on the next turn, we will have a neat high ground advantage, which should hopefully work in our favor. The two commanders don't make a move and Roselius has a squad side shot ready, so let's open things up with him so that the two enemies don't spot our ambush from above just yet. Enemy spotted. Okay, unsurprisingly the two immediately rush behind the nearest cover, but that won't help them for long because another grenade from Andrea will quickly get rid of it. This brings one of the commanders down to one hit point while the other one temporarily vanishes out of sight, but Luisa here quickly gets a visual again. The high ground also gives her a great chance to hit and crit, so let's see what she does with it. And with the second attempt, she gets the critical for the kill. The other enemy can now be eliminated by Resilius, who has a second double tap shot available. And that's it. Third group of hostiles down. Let's keep moving with Adam. After all, we still haven't found the second melt container. Right, so for a change, Adam does not immediately spot a new group of aliens, which means we can move the rest of our squad up across the roof without the risk of being spotted. What's making that noise? On the alien's turn then, we hear movement, sounds like a cyber disk if I'm not mistaken, and we also first sense and then eventually spot the meld in the cargo area ahead. And well, the melt container is a full cover object, so let's use it to advance Adam's scouting trip. Stepping off. That's what we're looking for. So, that is definitely not what we just heard on the alien's turn, but a group of chrysalids should not be too difficult to handle. Since we have four turns left on the melt, however, there is no need to rush things, so let's use the low cover we have available on the roof to give our soldiers a bit of protection and then activate Overwatch. The chrysalids should move on their turn and perhaps we can catch them off guard. And indeed, our enemies start running and we start gunning with four reaction shots from the roof, all benefiting from high ground bonuses. And that is enough to get us the first kill while the remaining two chrysalids now rush towards the meld and with that towards Adam, but his close combat specialist triggers and decimates the group further. Still, we're not quite in the clear yet because it was indeed a cyber disc we heard earlier and it is now entering the fight by going on Overwatch while its two drones stay close by. So unless I am severely mistaken, we have four enemies left in this mission, with the Cyberdisc probably being the most problematic, but far from impossible to deal with. To kick things off, we can hit a guaranteed critical with Resilius, which should do a decent amount of damage. Alright, 13 points, that is a hard hit indeed, and we took the shot with Mr. Wargal first for a good reason, as the cyber disc is now closed again and therefore a little harder to damage. It will open back up, however, if we trigger its overwatch, which is exactly what we're doing now with Adam, after collecting the melt, of course. And there we are, Cyberdisc back open, but Adam will take care of the chrysalid instead. Perfect, 
Chrysalid down, now we can send up Louisa, who not only has a guaranteed hit here, but due to the Cyberdisc being open again, also a very high chance for a critical. And while I had hoped to perhaps give her three kills with a well-placed grenade, the drones are unfortunately flying and therefore considered above the Cyberdisc, so a grenade can't hit them. Still, this would be Louisa's fourth kill of the mission, not too shabby at all. And there we go, Miss Santoso keeps up her aggressive performance, all that is left now are the two drones, and we won't get too elaborated here, a simple rocket from Andrea will do the trick. Operation was a success. And that's it, mission completed, we add 14 alien kills to our total, no injuries or casualties on our side, and so our first supply barge has been successfully taken down. Our soldiers returned home safely, and they recovered a significant amount of the meld substance for our research. Excellent work! Back in the base then, we finally have a promotion waiting for Louisa, so let's advance her to the rank of Major. This grants her the extra conditioning ability, giving her additional hit points based on which type of armor she's wearing, and since she is wearing the heaviest and most protective armor in the game, the bonus is large, bringing her up to 20 hit points just like Adam. On the loot side of things, we have recovered a heavy floater corpse, allowing us to perform another autopsy, but the supply barge had quite a bit of other useful goods on board, so apart from a number of corpses, we come away with a decent haul of Illyrium, Alloys, Weapon Fragments, Meld and Alien Machinery, both intact and damaged. Annette is confident that within the last few months of her captivity, Exalt forces launched a direct assault on the aliens in order to recapture her for themselves. If what she's saying is true, Exalt is even more brazen and dangerous than we initially suspected. A bit more backstory on Annette here, interesting but not really fitting the current situation. In any case, we are now quickly stopping by at the Grey Market to sell the damaged alien equipment and we have stasis tanks, flight computers, surgeries and power sources to spare for a grand total of 120 credits. In the next episode, we will perhaps find a way to utilize that money, but before we wrap things up, let's also quickly perform the heavy floater autopsy, which again, we can do instantly, of course. Another variation on a previously identified specimen, this is the heavy floater. As you can see, the aliens have made substantial improvements to the armor and weapon systems available, while removing some of its exposed vulnerabilities an extremely dangerous combatant. Alright, so the autopsy just unlocked a single foundry project and one that is unfortunately of limited use to us. Advanced repair reduces repair times for shifts, which we will use eventually, but probably only rarely, as well as for interceptors, of which we have several on every continent, so having one out of action for a few days is not the worst thing in the world. Very importantly, this project does not affect the repair times of firestorms, which would of course be much more useful. For the sake of full completion, we will of course grab this foundry project eventually, but you can imagine that it is not a priority at the moment. Our researchers meanwhile can continue their work on heavy lasers and we can make the cut in today's episode. In the next one, I hope to give our psionic heavy Kim Lupai another go on the battlefield. Today's mission wasn't really well suited for that, because we need enemies with low will scores to make the most of her psionic abilities, and the crew of a supply barge usually does not fulfill those parameters. So stay tuned for the next video, and in the meantime, if you enjoyed this one, then I would be very happy if you could leave a thumbs up. If you like what I'm doing and want to support me and my channel further, then you can of course go ahead and subscribe to help the channel grow, or you can support me over on Patreon. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you next time. Cheers.